we are almost near the end. People are a little bit tired, but there's been a lot of wonderful work produced by the students this summer. Um, I want to just welcome all of you to go and check out our thesis exhibitions as well as our first and second year exhibition. The exhibition upstairs is temporarily on hold for a conference that's visiting, but it will be back up and running on Saturday. And the thesis exhibition is at the former Museum of Contemporary Craft, 724 Northwest Davis. And that hours are Wednesdays to Saturdays, noon to five. Is that right, guys? Thursdays to, sa to Sunday. Okay, so visit that space. We have one student, Gerardo Vargas, who's over here. And his work is part of the thesis exhibition, but it's on the premises here upstairs in communication design room 208. So tonight, I'm now going to turn it over to our second year student, Kunja Lee, who's going to do a little bit more expanded introduction of Shannon. So thanks. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Kunja Lee, uh, second year MFA law residency. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our visiting artist. No. I'm sorry, visiting curator, <laughs> Shannon Stratton. Uh, Shannon Stratton is the William and uh, um, Mildred Raston chief curator at the Museum of Art and Design. For 12 years, she was the director and curator of Three Worlds in Chicago, a contemporary art space that she co-founded in 2003. Three Worlds founded the Hand in Globe conference, conference and later co-founded the Common Field Network for Grassroots Art initi Initiatives as well as a publishing phone book, a guide to grassroots and alternative artist resources throughout the United States. Current exhibitions include Atmosphere, for enjoyment, the first exhibition to deal solely with Harry Bottoria's sounding sculptures and the traveling exhibition, Face Wilding, Fearful Symmetries, the first retrospective of the work of Wilding, a key figure in the feminist art movement. Welcome, Ms. Stratton. Um, okay, let me fix those. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to be in Portland again, um, which I feel um, lucky to have been to a few times for a couple different projects. So years ago, in 2010, I curated an exhibition with my colleague Judith Lehman at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts, so I got to spend quite a bit of time in Portland um, when I did that project, which will show up in this slide presentation. Um, I um, am actually have a background in studio practice. I have an MFA in fiber and material studies, so it's okay to say I'm a visiting artist. <laughs> and, um, and I taught for the last 12 years at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so I have a long career behind me as a teacher, hopefully not permanently behind me. Um, but I'm just saying that to kind of preface how I usually address having an artist talk at a school, which is um, different, I suppose, than when I'm invited to a conference or a place where I'm delivering a really specific kind of thesis about work that I'm doing. I don't know why that noise just happened. Um, I like usually like to take the approach to talking to students to talk about what my path has been uh, to my work and the kinds of decisions that I've made um, professionally along the way. Um, particularly because I did start out as a studio major, both a BFA and an MFA, before um, embarking on work as an organizer, which is actually the term I kind of prefer to use. Um, although I do like the old-fashioned definition of a curator, which means to care for things. Um, but in the past, and I, and I care for the art communities that I belong to, but um, for the 12 years that I ran Three Walls, I wasn't caring for a collection, which is usually what the word curator is associated with although I do now at a museum. Um, 
So uh, up, there's this quote up on, on the screen right now. It's up to us to complicate, not cooperate with business as usual, which I stole from my fed friend Sam Gold's um, Facebook page last week, um, <laughs> uh, who is an activist, artist, and organizer uh, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he was talking about the election. But um, I found this quote actually really useful because as I, um, I was in Vancouver last week doing a very similar gig at the Emily Carr um, University of Art and Design, visiting their low-res program and doing another talk to a, a kind of small group of graduate students. And at that point, because uh, it was the beginning of the um, political conventions, I was feeling not particularly, um, you know, I guess, uh, not feeling that uh, the work that I was doing or the narrative that I was going to be telling was particularly important or powerful at that moment. And, um, and I wanted to talk about that with other artists. Um, I think the weird thing about situations like this is um, when somebody's standing at a podium, it puts them in some kind of position of authority or expertise, but actually we all kind of create the art communities and the communities that we belong to together. I'm not an expert about art. I happen to have carved out a space for myself and been working in it um, for a number of years and can talk to you about my experiences, but we all create the space that we work in and that's really what I want to talk about and um, what it means to complicate and not cooperate with business as usual. I'm not a politician, so I'm going to talk about that in relationship to the art world, but I think we're at a kind of moment right now historically where it's really, um, it's really pertinent to me to think about what's kind of important to me, um, what's urgent to me about working in the arts, what kind of responsibility the arts have um, it, to the community what, that it's a part of, what kind of civic responsibility art institutions have as not-for-profits, um, what kind of responsibility somebody has as a curator or an organizer um, of artwork, of art projects within a community. Um, and these are things that are really pressing concerns to me. And as I moved from a period of my life, a long period of my life, where I exited a graduate program as somebody holding an MFA, as somebody who conceived of myself as an artist. I founded an artist-run center. I ran that for 12 years, and that distanced me from the studio and landed me in a curatorial position at a museum, which institutionally is significantly different than running an artist-run center. And I think for me has brought home a lot of really kind of important and pressing questions about, again, like what role an arts organization has as a not-for-profit um, in a city, in a community. What's the civic responsibility of institutions um, and art? Um, so, uh, you know, I say that with, these are my positions, this is, this is where I'm coming from, with somebody who's had a practice um, for, you know, a while in the arts. Um, this is space that I'm holding in this room, and I've been invited here to be in dialogue with you, so you might not agree with how I approach the art world, you know, might not agree with my positions about institutions or about the commercial art world, but this is the, from the experience that I've had and the place that, that I want to work from. Um, in the arts. So when I talk about complicating, not cooperating with business as usual, it comes from a place of really thinking about how institutionalized and corporate a lot of structures for the arts have become. That they don't differentiate themselves too much from the corporate stru structures that the commercial world have. Um, that was one reason that it was very important to me um, to think about making and creating an artist-run space in Chicago after I left graduate school. Um, I came out of a craft program. Um, or like a, a craft in the expanded field program, fiber um, really extends itself from um, frequent, often in this country anyways, a feminist art history. So even though it's related to a history um, of functional craft, of weaving, of, of disciplines that we think of as, as coming from a kind of more functional craft background, it really takes up a lot of space politically. Um, so it was coming out of this um, training in fiber, both as an undergraduate graduate in Canada and a graduate student in Chicago, and thinking about what craft kind of means as a practice. Um, and I really love this quote by Richard Sennett. I'll tell you who said these things. I won't pretend that I did. <laughs> um, which uh, says both the difficulties and possibilities of making things well apply to human relationships. Um, Richard Sennett's a sociologist um, that taught for a long time at Columbia University and wrote this book called The Craftsman, which has become a really important, um, I think, kind of uh, guiding uh, kind of text for me because as a sociologist, he wrote about, wrote through craft, wrote with craft as an example of the way humans, um, through practice and community and dedication um, to materials, to process, um, it, 
through that kind of investment of time, develop not just relationships, but become kind of, that it's a world-making activity. And this quote pulls from that book, and I think what's, what's important to me about it is that craft is something that's not just about how we um, work with materials and things, but it's also about how we work with one another. And for me, leaving a studio practice to create a space um, and an exhibition platform and um, a presentation platform and resources for artists in Chicago and then later um, kind of on a more national scale, it became really important to me to try to reconcile what it meant to have had once had a studio practice with what it meant to be kind of working in the not-for-profit field. And so his writing was really important to me because he starts off talking about you know, a, a traditional idea of a craftsman in an atelier, you know, um, making glass or making violins, and that by the end of the book is talking about urban planners and parents and people whose craftsmanship is much more about the relationships that they have with other people and the relationships they have with architecture and with space and community and, and so forth. And I, that was an interesting leap for me because I realized that what I had learned through craft, I could apply through what it meant to work administratively. Um, so in uh, 20, uh, 2003, uh, <laughs> I, I left the School of the Art Institute, as I said, with an MFA in fiber. And um, as somebody who'd grown up in Canada with a lot of exposure to the artist-run um, community, I guess, in that country, um, I was really interested in the fact that I lived in this um, city in the US and didn't see that much evidence of artist-run activity in the United States. Now, at that time after graduate school, I wasn't fully aware of you know these kind of 30, 40 year old odd spaces that were still located in New York and to some degree in Los Angeles and a few other places across the country. I was just looking at Chicago at that moment and some of the spaces that had emerged during the artist run space um, kind of movement in the late 60s to early 70s had started to close in Chicago. And they closed because the National Endowment for the Arts started, stopped funding those kinds of spaces. And my really quick sort of lesson in arts administration is that if you're going to build a not-for-profit platform, um, there's this kind of visual that people use in the field that you need to have a stool that has three legs, three secure legs on it that help to make the seat or the platform stand. And that's, you know, foundation funding, um, individual or patronage funding, and then earned income. And that those three things equally have to help make that sort of help keep that seat or platform aloft. Um, and a lot of spaces closed uh, when the NEA cut funding to artist run spaces because they didn't have two other secure legs. They were um, relying too heavily on uh, NEA funding. Um, so in Chicago, uh, we were losing those spaces and a lot of artists had come in and started to fulfill those roles by create, um, starting kind of much more um, at sort of temporary uh, s spaces in their apartments or in the garage or in their yard or in their car, really kind of creatively thinking through what an exhibition platform was um, for their colleagues in the city. And that was really exciting energy to me and uh, Chicago still generates a lot of that energy and in fact has trickled out into other parts of the country. I think Chicagoans often, uh, there's a lot of great kind of um, apartment spaces in New York right now that are run by folks that, that you know, um, went to grad school or undergraduate school in Chicago and sort of brought that energy with them to other cities. Um, but at the time that I was leaving school, um, as much as I loved the, the, what was dynamic about that, um, I was also concerned that it didn't um, provide a kind of um, resource for artists other than a space to exhibit. Um, and there were some important things that I think artists need, like you know, an artist fee, um, maybe an opportunity for somebody to write about their work, um, documentation of the exhibitions that they've had, um, other kinds of support that help um, further their practice and um, further the work that they're doing, not you know, beyond uh, the group of people that they um, kind of interact with. And so, um, I, with three other people, founded uh, Three Walls, uh, which is, that's our first logo on the left and the last one on the right, um, in 2004. And uh, we founded it in the West Loop in Chicago, um, which for a long time had been a gallery district. It's uh, kind of a warehouse, performer meatpacking district, still very few kind of butchers and meatpacking um, places in the neighborhood, but mostly now it's, um, mostly now it's um, just kind of a restaurant kind of area. But um, at the time, there were still a lot of galleries there. They've been, uh, Google has moved into the neighborhood, so that's been displacing, you know, as it goes. <laughs> so that's been displacing 
um, the art spaces. Um, but we uh, opened a spot there, and when we opened, we first started out as a residency program. Um, and uh, our intention with a residency program was that at that very moment in Chicago, a lot of artists were kind of fleeing the city. They felt like there weren't, there was no reason to stay there. Nobody was looking to Chicago as an important art community. Nobody was coming there to do work or make work. That it was a place you went to go to school and then you quickly left to go to New York. Um, and so we started out as a residency program because we wanted to bring artists at pivotal points in their career to come uh, do projects in the city and have a positive experience with that art community, meet other artists there, make connections with Chicago-based artists and institutions and alternative spaces and so forth, visit our students, et cetera, et cetera, and start kind of building a stronger network for Chicago artists. Whether or not that meant that it would or wouldn't keep Chicago artists there it was about le at least helping to create some kind of connection um, to an art world outside the Midwest. Um, so for the first uh, kind of, uh, let me see, three years, um, we operated uh, as a residency with um, a kind of 50% of our program would be a resident artist we brought in, and 50% of our program would be solo exhibitions by local artists. Um, one of our first residents um, was Kyla Mallett, who's a Vancouver-based artist, um, whose slide I like to start this with because we were, the West Loop is, was very much a commercial gallery district, so it was something very different about presenting um, an exhibition where there was no art on the walls. Kyla came in and did this project called Gossip, where she set up a gossip hotline and collected, uh, you know, gossip that people called in, had it reperformed, and then buried it in the walls of the gallery. So you had to come in and press your ear to the wall and kind of find the sweet spot. Um, at that moment in uh, Illinois, there was quite a lot of um, controversy around the governor at the time. So she actually collected some some legitimate political, well, maybe legitimate <laughs> political gossip. So it was a great combination of kind of personal gossip, political gossip um, in the walls of this space. Um, so we operated uh, doing residency exhibitions, um, like I said, for the first three years with some solo exhibition projects. Our emphasis was really on trying to support um, a combination of things like new work that would be exciting to bring into the city and would connect to artists that were living and working there, and then also bringing in projects that were maybe challenging um, for that artist to find support or other kind of venues for that work. Um, and that um, part of the equation really um, helped steer the um, artistic direction of the organization in the future. Um, this was a project by uh, resident Danny Leventhal, who um, is based in New York State now, um, who uh, did this work about um, access um, and privilege. Uh, it's, a, it's a ramp, as you can tell, but um, the West Loop was, a, like I said, a meatpacking and shipping district, so she collected all these shipping, um, plot, um, uh, what are those things called? <laughs> Thank you, pallets. <laughs> it's like pedestals, platforms, pallets um, from the neighborhood and then um, disassembled them to create this kind of slowly more refined kind of wood floor until you got to the very peak of uh, this platform where it was so narrow that only one person could stand on the platform, but the platform was finished like a parquet floor from those pallets. And then, of course, the pallet, the entry point to that ramp where the most people can stand is the rough platform, the raw platform as it's found. I think that probably goes without saying what our metaphor is there about access and privilege and um, who gets to have, you know, this kind of loftier vantage point. But at the same time, this loftier vantage point was lonely, uncomfortable, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't actually uh, the most ideal place to be within this kind of artwork. Um, so, um, just to kind of uh, move as quickly, I'm, I'm really showing you very select things because there's 12 years of exhibition history and uh, probably over 100 artists that I worked with, so we're being <laughs> narrowing it down. Um, in 2007, we shifted our focus to um, really try to support more artists locally. Um, so we didn't um, completely dissolve the residency program, but we made the residency more of a project where people who had specific kind of research um, and engagement they wanted to do in Chicago and region to come in and do that work. And we had an apartment in the space. Um, I'll explain the space in, in just a moment. But um, we'd gotten so much um, kind of support and uh, both from foundations and from uh, the press and from curators and other people who are looking at the program that we realized that actually um, 
probably what we really needed to do was give that to give that space back to artists working um, primarily in Chicago, but also the Midwest in general. Um, and I think that this is probably something people in many cities across the U.S. can um, kind of speak to if they're not in the major uh, two poles of the art world, New York and L.A., is that um, lots of artists stay and work and teach in these communities, but sometimes don't have a lot of opportunity to get their work seen outside of the city, seen by curators that are being brought into the city. Um, they, they're maybe in a bit of an echo chamber with their colleagues. Um, but we'd, it, you know, the the space had had quite a lot of kind of national um, and international attention. And so it occurred to us that, you know, maybe what we needed to do was really give that opportunity to artists um, within Chicago. The way the program ran is that um, uh, there was a advisory board that was created that I worked with in doing the programming. And that board consisted of other artists in Chicago that worked in that, that we tried very hard to represent a variety of disciplines, associations with a lot of the different schools, which is, um, I bring that up because Chicago is very academically um, oriented. It's very much built around the academic programs in the city at SAIC, at Columbia College, at the University of Illinois, at the University of Chicago, and at Northwestern University. That's five graduate programs <laughs> and undergraduate programs in the visual arts. So. Most people are tied to that school <laughs> somehow, whether they're faculty or working in administration or, you know, so there's uh, those kinds of allegiances. So we really tried to make sure that we represented people that were connected to different groups of artists, people that were unaffiliated. Um, and those artists uh, self-nominated their replacement or other people to join the committee. So it wasn't um, necessarily, at a certain point, it was about that group of people kind of generating um, that panel for themselves. Importance of doing that to me as opposed to um, kind of self-electing myself as an expert, as a curator, uh, comes from the fact that I was an artist and feeling like one of the things that frustrates me a great deal about the art world is that it's been set up in a way where somebody else is the expert. Um, and I have an art history degree, I know art historians, they're great people, but they study and look at and participate with art in a very different way than artists do. It's not their field in the same way that it is for artists. And as an artist run space, it was very important to me that artists have a voice in deciding what, are, what work in their community was urgent and needed to be seen and who needed to be supported. So that was the reason of create, creating that committee. Just like you can think of a, you know, journals in other fields where the editor is, you know, a science journal might is edited by a scientist. You know, there's some kind of relationship between the practitioners and also the voice that's kind of editing the material that's that's um, becoming public. So um, that was an important part of the structure. And um, when we started exhibiting local artists, that structure was created. So from 2007 forwards. Um, there was this advisory panel that eventually um, became uh, what was called the community cabinet. So the guiding kind of principle for our decisions going forward with exhibitions was about really looking at artists from all stages in their career. Um, emerging artists, absolutely, always. But it's interesting, emerging artists are kind of a favorite amongst <laughs> our, you know, foundations, amongst art spaces. Everyone wants to support emerging artists. They want to find the next hot thing, give them opportunity, be like head of the head of the game. And often it's really kind of mid-career artists or um, established artists that have not been showing recently that get short shrift, that aren't the ones showing their work. And in Chicago, that was particularly notable because we had so many teaching artists who their students had never really seen their work. Um, because their opportunities are really limited in the city. Our two major museums, the, school, um, the Art Institute of Chicago and the MCA, at this time were not really showing local Chicago artists. Now I can, um, there could be some implication in this story that Three Walls helped change business as usual um, through being really aggressive about how we positioned the importance of the program and who participated in it. Um, I talked about it the same way then as I do now. Um, the community cabinet was a very active, vocal sort of group of people in terms of speaking about the importance of the program. So it's possible that we helped really change um, the way larger institutions were looking at their local community. Um, but at this moment in 2007, when we moved towards um, supporting people within the city and within the region, th there weren't a lot of opportunities um, for, like I said, mid-career, more established, like artists that weren't um, commercially represented and uh, teaching artists, et cetera, to show their work. 
So um, the committee would hold both of those two ideas in mind simultaneously. How can we support really exciting emerging work that needs to be seen now? How can we support practices by artists who've been working for a long time, have been dedicated, um, and have work that uh, you know is important? Um, maybe they're taking new risks in their studio practice. Um, you know, maybe we haven't seen their work in quite some time. Maybe we just simply need to support them because um, we've lost track of their voice in this community. Um, and then uh, thirdly, there was a real kind of emphasis on trying to choose work that um, while we did show um, objects that might be more easily um, kind of purchased or sold or um, distributed, you know, small things, paintings, et cetera, et cetera. There was, much, there was very much an emphasis on work that couldn't so easily fall into that kind of commercial category. So um, performative work, uh, new media work, um, large scale sculpture, <laughs> like Kelly Kaczynski's Stages, which was a, a long-term installation practice that she was working on. Um, kind of performative work like uh, this is, this was a very kind of complicated, multi-tiered uh, project that Irina Heyduk did that this was the, the opening of the exhibition that involved um, all of the people at that opening kind of reciting one of her sailor dirges. Um, Claire Pentecost, who actually happens to be in town right now for Converge, um, who was in Documenta in 2013 and her work's very political in nature. Um, very concerned with addressing everything from drones to soil to um, to food that, uh, again, like, these are more established artists. <laughs> um, film, uh, this is Ben Russell. Uh, you, feel you can't see his work. It's a great photo of people watching it. <laughs> um, Zach Cahill, who was a, an emerging artist at the time, um, and this kind of uh, fairly complicated multi-part project where he imagined a country called the USSA, um, and which was a, obviously like a collapse of, of this republic and, the, and, a, and a communist regime. And uh, Lori Palmer, who's uh, this project whole, uh, which doesn't quite give you a real sense of the magnitude of this thing. It was a hole that she constructed out of lumber, um, repurposed lumber from uh, homes that had been uh, repossessed after bankruptcy and then, um, and then uh, it, it taken down in the suburbs of Illinois. And she'd gotten that lumber and created this hole that you could be hoisted up to look down into. Um, and that weird chair there on the side is what you got hoisted up into. What was really beautiful about the work is that you needed two other people. You needed a partner. You needed somebody else to kind of hoist you up in that chair. And so this whole evening of this uh, exhibition, it was this kind of incredible moment of watching people like mentors hoist up their students, students hoist up their mentors, partners hoist each other up, friends, etc., strangers to kind of look down in this hole and reflect on um, the mortgage crisis and the housing crisis um, in, you know, across the country. Um, outside of exhibiting uh, people locally, uh, we still, like I said, um, tried to maintain some kind of residency program, but think it through really differently and in a really flexible manner. So the way the space worked, um, it was pretty, uh, it is, it was a very uh, janky kind of situation that we made work out, I think, quite well. Um, at the time that we moved into the space in the West Loop, it was, um, that was, Google opened this space like a year ago. So before Google, oddly, nobody was too concerned with the West Loop, even though it was just west of downtown Chicago and across the highway. Um, so we, there were a lot of kind of warehouse buildings that weren't partic under particularly good um, care. <laughs> you know, the landlords didn't care too much about them. I think a lot of a lot of landlords in Chicago and the West Loop especially would sit on their property and not look after it with the, you know, sort of waiting for the market to go up so they could just sell the land, which is actually what happened with our building um, just this year. Um, but we had rented two units, like combined them into one. It, it was like a, um, somebody told me it was like a, like a rats, uh, like a rats warren. What is that? Is that the right word? Like a, it's like, a, like something rodents lived in, because <laughs> there were so many little rooms and passages between things and like multiple doors um, leading into this unit. But um, what we had was an apartment and a kitchen in the back um, for visitors, uh, kind of a wood shop space, our offices, uh, kind of a reception area with a bar, and then about 1,800 square feet of exhibition space and kind of a smaller project room. Um, so we could have a resident staying with us and then have programming happening in the main space. And then we tried to work with our residents um, 
where, like I said, we were looking for people who wanted to come to town and ha because they had a really specific project um, that made sense for them to do in Chicago, and then we'd try to connect them with other programs in the city or other spaces and make it a, a really kind of interconnected uh, kind of um, residency for them. Um, so I like call using Colleen as an example because um, she was a resident artist who came to us um, at that time from San Diego um, as a filmmaker who wanted to come to Chicago because she had been working on a long-term project on um, jazz and the urban matrix in the United States and wanted to come do research on Sun Ra in the city. Um, and so um, what I love about Colleen's story is that she, her residency really extended over multiple years because it was research-based and and eventually she just moved to Chicago <laughs> and started teaching in the city and has become a really important and powerful part of the Chicago art community um, and a really kind of powerful leader as an African-American woman and a filmmaker. She's made a really impact on that art community. So I, I like that like that residency opened up the city to somebody who felt like this was a place that they wanted to make their home. Um, she left a teaching job to make it her home. So that, that felt like, wow, Chicago really did kind of make a connection with this artist that was meaningful to their work. Um, the slide that's up here is, um, so she did throughout um, her residency and visits to Chicago before she moved, um, had um, worked with uh, composers to arrange Sun Ra songs for high school marching bands, and then worked with high school marching bands on uh, in Chicago to do these pop-up performances. So they would show up at an empty lot or somewhere else in the city and play um, Spaces the Place or some other Sun Ra song, and then get on a bus and school bus and, and leave. So this is that performance being filmed. Um, we also uh, did a lot of exchange show um, exhibitions, um, and uh, that happened kind of throughout the history of Three Walls, starting, um, I think our first one was with Vox Populi in Philadelphia, and uh, the intention um, was to, um, again, try to connect with cities that weren't New York or LA to bring artists from other cities to Chicago um, for, um, you know, for exposure to our audience and bring um, Chicago artists to other cities, um, not just in the U.S., but towards the end of my tenure also outside of the country. Um, and, uh, you know, when setting up projects like this, you know, I'd be bringing a collaborator, a curator to Chicago to do visits with, you know, 20, 30 artists in the city, and then I'd be going to a city and also doing studio visits. So regardless of the outcome of the project, it was about making these kinds of connections. Um, how do you know who's making what kind of work you know, in Portland, Oregon, unless you go there and you meet those artists? How do you find those artists? Do you have a colleague who's, who, sh who gives you a list <laughs> and, and web website links to all of the artists in that city, so you start you know, learning about work that's happening all over the United States. So um, this is Misher, who you probably know because they're from Portland, um, and because Mac and I did an exchange here with the PNCA, um, which uh, that's how I met Laura. I <laughs> came here and got to meet her um, through those studio visits. So, you know, you see how it works. Um, and so uh, the, sh the show that Mac and I ended up putting together was Misher and Edie Fake, who uh, now lives in L.A., but it was in Chicago at the time. Um, who's an artist who does a lot of comics-based work, but is also um, has a drawing practice. Um, and you know who Misher is. So it was a two-person show, and it was, you know, for us, the model was that it was uh, a show that we adapted to our space and our audience based on what those um, artists wanted to exhibit. But other exchange shows were different. Um, it, you know, sometimes, um, uh, well, I'll actually get to one that's, that's, that's quite a bit different, which was um, the one that I just did before I left with um, Or Gallery in Vancouver, um, British Columbia slash Berlin, Germany, because they had a site there. And so this ended up becoming like a three-city exchange, and I invited in an artist who runs a more kind of traditional um, fringe kind of artist-run space in Chicago to participate because he'd actively been bringing artists from Germany into Chicago. So the three of us did studio visits in Chicago, in Vancouver, in Berlin, and then produced um, multiple shows at different sites. So a Chicago artist, uh, Tori Briggs, was in Berlin. He did a residency at our gallery for a month, um, produced this project, Dot Dash, where he um, installed this light bulb in an undisclosed location that was... Um, uh, kind of blinking out Morse code messages uh, for about six months. Um, and those messages were things that, that people entered in on a website that was being distributed um, constantly. So you could type anything in and your message would be um, being sort of flashed out somewhere in Berlin. Um, we brought David Hart to our gallery in Vancouver. 
Um, and we brought several artists um, from Vancouver and Berlin to Chicago because we had three exhibition sites that we used there. So um, in that situation, that felt like kind of, the, I, I was glad that that was kind of a cap to my career at the space because um, we had gotten a grant from the MacArthur Foundation, um, called International Connections Fund, a new grant that they'd started. And I said, well, hey, look, we did these projects, these exchange projects. You know, I, this is how this could work in the visual arts. Um, they mostly, like many foundations in Chicago, they mostly fund theater and dance, so they don't always know how to fund visual arts. And um, it just felt really impactful because that grant, which I think was $21,000, covered the flight for the three of us to visit three different cities to do studio visits, our artists to fly to those cities um, to present their work, um, shipping for their work, plus then, you know, as individual organizations, we covered the kind of basic cost of exhibitions. But um, I'm pointing this out to just, which will connect to the end of my story, which is how far $20,000 goes when you're a, not -for a small artist-run space and a not-for-profit, how far artists can stretch their buck to make a lot happen um, and get their work seen. Um, so, um, I guess in, in just in to that point, I think sometimes people wonder, how do you start a not-for-profit? Um, how much does it cost? I don't get it. Um, Three Walls, we um, had a fundraiser before we opened the space. We raised $5,000. Um, there was no personal money. Uh, I'm still carrying about 80 grand worth of debt from grad school around with me, so it wasn't like anybody had some money they invested into this. We raised the money. We used that money to rent our first space and start our first programming, and then from there started applying for grants based on you know, what we were spending at that time. So probably when we started to write a grant, you have to say, well, really, what are we spending on shows? And that would be like $24,000 a year or something. And then foundations will give you kind of a percentage of that um, operating funds to operate your program. That's where we started in 2003, 2004, and then when I left, our operating budget was $650,000 which isn't a lot of money, actually, in the grand scheme of, of art institutions, but it went very far in the context of an artist-run space. When I left, we had four, four paid staff, we had benefits, you know, it was a proper operating kind of not-for-profit. Um, so the other things that we did, which um, were really important to me because they were about supporting other people's work um, and creating a network of uh, spaces across the country and people who are interested in working outside of the um, standard kind of institutional setting. Um, Phone Book was um, a publication we began publishing in 2006. Um, this is not the last edition. There's a fourth edition that's out now, which you can still get from Three Walls website. Um, but it's um, a book that uh, it basically collects information about artist-run and alternative spaces, platforms, projects across the country. Um, in its fourth edition, it has a little bit over 100, 800 entries in it. Um, over the, what is that, like 10 years of publishing it, we, so we did four, we did kind of every two or three years. Um, it was really exciting to see how much that activity grew in the country. Um, so there's really a, a kind of, um, obviously artists really feel like their needs are not necessarily being met by the standard platforms. Um, and the kinds of things that the book covers are exhibition spaces, standard, you know, classic exhibition spaces, here's a show, but also um, micro cinemas, um, you know, different ki alternative kind of artist run, artist run residency projects like Acre in Steuben, Wisconsin, or um, Signal Fire, which is a tenting residency that happens out here on the West Coast. Um, and uh, other kinds of resources, basically, ultimately, that artists create for themselves. We included in the book um, really well-established artist-run spaces that at this point are well beyond being small, like White Columns. I mean, th those are um, well-funded organizations, but they're organizations that were founded with the same kind of ethos in mind. Um, the difference being that the, the spaces that came out of the first um, kind of wave of artist-run work in, the, in this country and in Canada as well they were created, um, you know, to show work that wasn't being represented institutionally. So in terms of the disciplines, video work and performance work, but also in terms of the artists, who's not being represented in institutions, women, queer artists, artists of color, that's where the artist-run movement sort of emerges from. Um, I think the urgency around why people make spaces today might have less to do with disciplines because, of course, you know, in a, a really... Um, hyper-capitalist moment, we've figured out how to sell just about everything, but I think there's still a concern about representation, about whose work is getting shown, about what the um, content or topic of that work is, 
Um, and still, and I mean, I'll still say this at the end of my lecture, institutions are burdened by a lot of other kinds of influence on the kinds of works that they show. So um, there's still a real, um, I think, a real importance to artists run spaces and artists having a voice in what's important to be seen, what work's important, why it should get shown, and what kind of um, impact art can have. Um, so anyways, phone book collects all of those kinds of spaces into one guide. A lot of those spaces don't last very long. I mean, the, this guide is about not just listing, like I said, these really established spaces like White Columns or the Kitchen or what have you in New York, but spaces that might only be around for two years, um, that might be really temporary. Um, and doing that is also about collecting that history to make sure that it's recorded somewhere that's recorded in a book with binding on it because who knows what's gonna happen to the internet, you know, where it's gonna go, like if you're gonna be able to have access to all this history someday, people don't maintain their websites after their space is closed, yada, yada, yada. So to us it was very important to maintain this hard copy for it to be in libraries, for it to be in schools, for it to be in people's hands. Um, we're also part of a network of, uh, found, of funds across um, the United States funded by the um, Andy Warhol Foundation, which is probably, remains probably um, the most progressive funder of the arts in the country. Um, and I say that because uh, they are a foundation that is um, for always for a long time um, made sure that their grants um, contributed to operation funds at organizations, which often foundations don't contribute to. They just give you money for projects, and they don't cover operations, meaning rent and people's salaries, like as if everybody's just supposed to be like a martyr to work in culture. Um, you know, and, and, the, and it's interesting. There was a, an article out recently about how the Ford Foundation has finally decided that um, rather than, you, so their allowance for a Ford grant was 15% of that grant could go towards operations and they'd recently released a statement that now you could put 20% of that towards operations. Well, Warhol's been doing that for, you know, ever. They've always believed in, in funding operations. Um, but they're just not the kind of foundation that, I, I wish they were a little bit louder about how they feel about funding because they're actually, I've always believed in really supporting the work artists do and supporting artist fees. Um, and one of the ways that they do this is they've is started this um, um, regranting project, which is important to bring up because they're they're all over the country. So there's one in Portland, um, and they you, the, you'll see if you, you I know you all don't live here necessarily, but there's one in Texas, um, there's one in Kansas City, there's one in Portland, Maine. I mean they they many sp states now have um, artist run centers that are associated with these grants, and. Um, what they do is they give um, not-for-profits an opportunity to give money directly to artists to do work um, in the public that's not associated with an institution. So the Propeller Fund and um, you know and you know everybody else, Rocket Grants is the one in Kansas City, and I can't remember the name of everybody's grants off my top of my head right now, but uh, Idea Grant I think is the one in Texas. They um, they, they give an organization opportunity of artists money directly to do projects in the public sphere. So um, instead of having to go through a museum or a school or some other kind of institution to put on a screening or curate a show or do an education program or um, publish something or you know whatever, uh, you can get a grant through this to produce those things yourself. And um, a portion of those funds can go to paying you, or paying other people, taking artist fees, however you want to distribute it. Um, so uh, we've, I mean, the Propeller Fund's been around at Three Walls um, now since 2009, so there's been a lot of things that we've funded, but, um, or 2010, pardon me, but 2010 was when we gave the money away, 2009 is when we took applications. Um, but just like an example, I think this is a really great example of something that, like, how would this have been funded? Um, and it would be funded through a grant like this. And this was a performance art project um, and a food truck called the Tamale Space Trio Performance and Tamale Truck. It was one of the first grants that we gave away. So it was a food truck that also had a performance aspect to it and a video, um, curatorial video project attached to it. Um, later on, you know, another example is that we funded the Dinka um, conference or uh, uh, gathering, which is um, kind of a digital projected and GIF conference, artwork conference. Um, so the grant really is about like giving people money to make these platforms themselves. It's kind of like a seed money grant, and often these projects go on to um, continue, or sometimes they're a one-off thing. 
Um, we also uh, produced a community supported art subscription um, and this is a program that uh, Springboard for the Arts in Minneapolis started. Um, and I'm giving you all the background on these things because I, I want everyone to understand that these things don't happen in a vacuum. Three Rolls did a lot of stuff. We didn't invent all of it. Nobody invents everything. Um, you're a part of a network and a community. You share ideas and you support one another. And you know, on an organizing level, that's something that's very real. Um, so people come up with interesting models and they should be shareable with other people to use those models. It's not like an intellectual property thing. Um, so community supported art was something the Springboard for the Arts created in Minneapolis, which was a subscription program um, to um, that the public could basically buy a subscription and then they would get um, different kinds of art experience. They might get tickets to a ballet or like to a to a dance theater or a coffee mug made by a ceramist or um, you know mixtape or you know a small print or something like that. Um, many spaces have adopted the CSA model over the years. We adopted it to be a program where people got like conceptual contemporary art um, in their subscription. So difficult things. <laughs> um, like, um, so this is one of Claire Pentecost's edition from 2013, Standard Spoil. She found the Carrera model, uh, Carrera marble from the Standard Oil building in Chicago that just very quickly that marble, the, that building was clad in this um, Carrera marble that wasn't um, adhered properly and um, due to changes in the weather cracked and fell off and um, down <laughs> many, 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 many flights um, to the ground and um, injured people and, you know, it was carted off. And um, she found uh, that marble in Indiana and made this series called the Standard Spoil, um, which, you know, reflects on um, capitalism, the oil market, um, you know, a, a significant kind of company in terms of Chicago's um, economic landscape. Um, just uh, to this, I mean, at this point, I think we'd um, commissioned work um, probably from around 60 artists um, around the time that I left. And um, one of the things about uh, community supported art was it wasn't necessarily that it was a big fun a big like income generator for three walls it generated some income but it was an opportunity to commission work from an artist that could then be distributed to an audience that couldn't afford a major artwork um, to be able to you could afford six hundred dollars to get maybe you know eight pieces of contemporary art is a pretty significant difference than six hundred dollars for a single piece of art. So the um, subscription would try to represent emerging through very established artists. So somebody who subscribed could get work from kind of all um, career stages in the city. Artists felt really, I think, excited to contribute to something like that where their work was seen alongside other artists at different stages, gouted into the hands of, you know, more regular people who might want to subscribe and collect. Um, and it's a little bit different than asking somebody to donate work for an auction because you're paying them um, materials and time for their work. And it was really up to the artists how they wanted to um, deal with their budget in that regard. Um, we also founded uh, the Hand and Glove Conference in 2011, um, which really stemmed from the Warhol Foundation uh, concluding something called the Initiative, which was... Uh, I don't understand. I don't know why that's... <laughs> I think my mom's Facebooking me because it's connected to the internet. <laughs> She can like see that I'm on the internet. And she's like, <laughs> "Hello." Um, the uh, hand and glove conference was, came out of the um, Warhol uh, concluding their initiative program, which was actually how we originally got funded by Warhol, which is um, a program that they did for a long time, funding artist-run not-for-profit space, small to medium-sized not-for-profits across the country. And they'd have this great conference that everyone who's funded by them could attend and talk about. Um, current issues in the field that were facing artists, that were facing small arts organizations. And when they concluded that program, that conference um, came to a close. And so we were interested in creating a conference that would have some of that energy and opportunity to talk about issues that were important around organizing um, platforms for artists as artists, um, but also invite people into that forum that hadn't that didn't necessarily have to have had that kind of special access like you did if you'd been a part of the Warhol Initiative. Um, so independent curators could come, people who were running apartment galleries could come, people who were, um, you know, not running any spaces could come but were interested in the topics at hand. Um, that conference kind of spun off to um, uh, some questions about what might be needed within the field of arts organizing and eventually led to the formation of the Common Field Network. 
um, which um, is a national network uh, dedicated to some of these questions. And I, I'm not a part of it anymore because I moved on to a different institution, but um, you know, they're um, moving forward with a conference model um, that sort of builds on the hand and glove um, events and um, is working to kind of more actively be involved in advocating for kind of smaller, um, more risk-taking not-for-profits with foundations. Often foundations feel wary of funding small not-for-profits. They don't want to fund artist fees. They don't want to fund operations costs. Like all of these problems that ultimately, um, you know, kind of can make a small organization hamstrung are some of the things foundations don't understand or don't see. And so one of Common Field's aims is to really kind of advocate for the importance of the spaces in the art landscape. Um, so um, kind of, I guess, maybe, um, and I'll, I'll try to be fast, because of course I'm running out of time already. Um, so three walls, like as you can tell, is a very important part of my um, practice. And, um, <clears throat> You know, sometimes you don't know those, I mean, you sort of know those things, you don't know them entirely until they're behind you. Um, but I think one of the reasons that it was very important to me is it felt like a really kind of active, dynamic, and important way to participate and work in the arts when I no longer was working in the studio. Um, and it's been interesting to transition into an institutional role where I am perceived as primarily a curator when I don't necessarily come um, from a background that um, specifically values um, the role of a curator in maybe the way um, institutions or art history programs do. It's not that I don't value curators or art historians, but my relationship to what it means to present artists and artwork is very different. Um, so those are a lot of questions for me now coming out of cr creating space. Um, and then, as you can see here, having done a number of um, kind of independent and collaborative curatorial projects outside of Three Walls and outside of other institutions. Um, and again, these are just a few things, but um, a lot of the work that I was doing independently was about kind of capturing what was happening in contemporary studio practice that had relationship to craft. Um, because as I said, I came out of a fiber program, two fiber programs, and then eventually did an MA where I was looking at um, how artists were using craft performatively or how the artists were working at this kind of intersection between craft and performance art. Um, so these are just some select projects, and I'll really rest on talking about this show because it was here in Portland, um, and because Namita is here. <laughs> just kidding. Well, it's, you are here. I would have talked about it anyways. Um, but in 2010, um, myself and artist Judith Lehman did this project at um, the former Museum of Contemporary Craft, and um, it was a really um, kind of important show, I think, um, f definitely for us uh, in trying to kind of grapple with um, the way craft was being um, utilized performatively by artists to talk about labor primarily. Uh, it also talk about um, collaboration, um, to talk about, like, to engage in institutional critique, um, to talk about issues around identity and the institution, queer identity, the identity of artists of color. So it was, um, it was a complicated exhibition and the way we decided um, to kind of design it, which um, was possible because of the very particular kind of architecture of the museum um, in that it's had those windows surrounding it. So it felt like a vitrine or um, I don't think you call them vitrines in the US, you know what I mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, that the windows around the side meant that you could look in and kind of see this action happening or this object within the space. So the first uh, gesture of the show was that the um, two artists, um, Sarah Black and John Preuss, um, built, uh, who were collaborators at the time, um, built this kind of platform or studio space within the museum that the artists um, would then inhabit over the course of the exhibition, which was about five months long, as residents. Um, and their work, all, all of the artists' work had a performative aspect to it. So they basically were proposing particular kinds of performances in the space and then would leave behind um, some kind of evidence of that performance or their work um, that was conceptually kind of important or tied to their projects and the themes of the show. So gestures of resistance, meaning, you know, this, you know, that very basic idea that kind of s the hummingbird, you know, that the small kind of gesture is still some kind of gesture towards change and progression. Um, so Sarah and, uh, and, and John, uh, as collaborators, constructed this out of reclaimed lumber from a barn um, that was uh, local to Portland. 
and then they constructed it. They, they first erected a wall across the museum and then communicated through this wall about the moves that they were making to build this structure. And you could see it, this happened live, so this didn't happen in advance of the show opening. It was the show. And um, what was really incredible about it, you can see them listening to each other through this wall, is that they clearly completely understood each other. They had a very special kind of relationship and dance as collaborators that resulted in their ability to build something that was pretty identical on both sides, with, with the exception of weird things, like they had different heights of stacks of lumber, and one of them was messier about how they stacked things than the other. Um, so, um, artists that were in the show, um, Anthea Black did a, a postering project, um, a part of a printmaking um, project she does called Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places, um, which is a project about queer love, and she, um, she, was, she came in and did a workshop with students at PNCA and made post a new poster, a new project that was posted around um, Portland, as well as bringing in some of the posters that were a part of her project by artists around Canada and the U.S., um, Theaster Gates was in the exhibition, and um, this was the the greatest, most tense moment of like exhibition activity I've ever had. In that his uh, final um, piece, his was the final piece, and he did a two-day performance where he um, sang hymns and covered the exhibition space in a porcelain slip. And it was a very emotionally charged exhibition, and it's uh, in an institutional setting. It makes it exceptionally charged because there's always, um, you know, a great deal of kind of bureaucratic tension around mess and around, um, it, like, literal mess. I mean, porcelain slip, he, he threw it against the wall. It was covering the floor. And so there was this existing tension with the institution and obviously this tension that... Um, around the idea of representation who's represented within the canon of craft, in a canon of craft in the United States within institutional space, ideas around permission, um, and it, it was quite incredible. Um, some other projects that happened prior to me um, moving on to uh, the Museum of Arts and Design, um, an exhibition called Resonating Bodies at the Soap Factory in Minneapolis might remember Kelly Kaczynski's stages at Three Walls. She constructed these much larger stages that were inserted at these angles throughout the soap factory space. Um, Judith Lehman, who I collaborated with as a curator in Gestures of Resistance, created these um, QR code uh, stools that were distributed around the exhibition and acted as um, the, the didactics to the exhibition. So both it was both seating, and if you scanned the QR code, it would take you to this video um, it, you understood it if you read the label that these were didactics, but it would all it take you to this video of this just very kind of choreographed kind of hand movements where she was sort of performing almost these little puppet shows with objects. So her didactic um, information was actually um, poetic and interpretive and not didactic at all. Um, this is a, a piece by Sarah Black and Julian Soto where they collected voices of people in the Minneapolis area to eventually build this choir um, on the speakers around this kind of seating. Um, the point of this show, Resonating Bodies, was about um, dealing with artists that um, uh, I was interested in how we think about performance art and social practice as being about presence, but sculpture has very much been about negotiating presence and absence in the space in a very performative way that the audience members are sort of always kind of performing within those objects or against those objects. So these were artists that think about sculpture in, in that, um, through that kind of lens. Um, and then uh, a project I'm still involved in, which is this uh, retrospective of Faith Wilding's work, who was a really pivotal character in Woman House and the feminist art movement uh, in Los Angeles in California in the 70s. Um, she, for a long time, um, has been a very active, been involved as an activist artist, a performance artist, and a pedagogue. Um, but a lot of her work, um, a lot of what she's known for, are two very specific works of art that were part of Woman House, her performance, Waiting, and then an installation, the crocheted environment that's become kind of an, known as the womb room. Um, but what she's not very well known for, um, which is the, an entire life's worth of work in painting and drawing, which was really exciting to kind of uncover that archive and represent that, particularly at a moment when people are reconsidering and rethinking feminist art histories. Um, and, you know, I think if you look around at the kinds of exhibitions and programming happening at museums, finally um, important women artists are getting their space, taking up space in the institutional setting. 
So um, it was it was really um, a real. It's been a pleasure. It continues to be a pleasure to work with Faith on this show. Um, we were able to put the largest. Um, version of the exhibition on at the Pasadena Armory uh, last fall, which you can see the shots of it here. But just, this is sort of one of these interesting things, I think, about art history and how things become, quote unquote, canonized. You know, Faith has been canonized for two um, pieces of work. One, the womb room, which doesn't really represent her practice at all. She's not a fiber artist, and she's been um, framed as such uh, in art history where she's made um, really like about three or four pieces in fiber, but really is a painter and drawer. And uh, text-based artist, she makes a lot of text-based art. And I, I find that compelling because I think one of the reasons why a lot of her work has gone unrecognized is it's watercolor, it's very feminine. Um, she uses a lot of language, like feminine language and politics in her work that I think has flown under the radar um, for its unabashed um, kind of tone and subject matter. Um, so, um, in addition to kind of doing that project, Three Walls and doing some curatorial work, I have been involved in other kinds of not so exhibition based things which have been very important to me. Um, I've worked with my partner for a number of years on um, a family farm that, um, uh, that was in his family in Chesterell, Ohio, which is in southeast Ohio and Appalachia. Um, we ran a very, very casual artist residency program there, which has been very important to me because of its extremely, extremely counter-institutional nature. It's not a not-for-profit. <laughs> we don't write grants. You know, it's very much like a temporary intentional community. Um, we had, you know, people within Chicago who would invite them to invite other people out that we didn't know, but it was, there was a recording studio there. I mean, I mean, it was a very casual, very rough environment. People tented, we cooked together, we lived together, we met one another, we worked together, we yelled at each other, whatever. We got drunk together, we danced together, we, <laughs> you know, but it was this, um, a really important setting, I think, to kind of work as artists outside of the frameworks of really, um, uh, like schools, um, museums, uh, art fairs, commercial galleries, artist-run centers, and other artist residencies that are set up to be um, kind of much more, um, I guess, kind of uh, uh, like predictable kinds of um, environments. Um, so I just love this photo of Julie White's floating in this mud pond. Um, and again, I think something uh, that's important to me about this space, uh, I remember inviting a student of mine out who I thought would really enjoy it and him saying to me one day as we're sitting on the deck, on the kind of front porch, like, I'm really sorry, I haven't really made any work and I don't want you to be upset with me. I was like, ah, <laughs> you don't have to make any work. You know, you know, if what you need to do right now is read books or listen to music or go on long hikes in the forest or you know, um, roast marshmallows, like that's what you need to do, you know, that's, it's uh, Im important because um, the one major takeaway that I have from my undergraduate degree um, was something that um, this artist Mary Scott told her uh, graduate uh, seminar class. She was a very kind of powerful figure at ACAD in Calgary and um, a very smart kind of feminist um, artist to um, you know, made work through like complex French theory and things that at the time my 19 year old brain was like, I don't get this woman, but she's amazing and I want to be like her. <laughs> and she wears like crazy leggings. And I mean, she just was a really powerful figure at that school. And I think for, for, for women at the school. And um, at the time that she was teaching, she wasn't making any art, and she said that. She said, I'm not making any art right now. I'm gardening, I've got cats, I'm cooking, I'm reading poetry, but I'm not making art, and that's fine. I'm still an artist, because um, it all goes in the soup. And I think that was, like, absolutely, without a doubt, the most important thing anyone's ever told me. Kind of still makes me want to cry a little bit. Because people often say to me, oh, well, what are you doing now? What do you know? Do you still have a studio practice? And that kind of shame immediately comes up like, oh, no, I don't. Like, I still want to say I'm an artist, but I'm not making anything right now. Um, or I'm, like, writing weird poems that nobody's going to read. Or, you know, I sewed something last night or whatever. You know, but I feel this great shame that maybe I'm no longer an artist. And, and then I think about Mary saying this and um, how much that kind of meant to me, and I think gave me a lot of permission to do what I felt was necessary with my life and with my creative practice. See, I kept choked up. <laughs> she was a badass. Um, 
So, you know, and so it made things like this possible to me. Like as a teacher, um, I taught at Oxbow. Um, hopefully I'll be back there next summer. Um, and taught classes like Party is Form, which was a social practice class where we um, spent time um, reading from sociology and anthropology and philosophy and political science and talking about what it means to be a good host, what it means to be a good guest, what it means to form groups, what play is, what liminal space is. Um, instead of talking about social practice and trying to grapple with that, what is, you know, with this sort of emerging field, but actually talk about what it means to work with other people and create spaces for them. And Oxbow is this amazing artist residency. I've kind of plugged it to a couple of people here. If you don't know about it, look it up, go. It's wonderful. The woman who runs it right now is fantastic. It's an incredible group of people and a warm community that take good care of you. And a big part of, I think, what makes Oxbow special is that they're good hosts. And like I said um, <laughs> to my host here at the PNCA, that this school's been a really good host to me. And it's actually really incredible how much that means in the arts. Warhol was an incredible host to the people they funded over the years. And I think when you do this kind of work and sometimes it gets hard and you doubt about what you're doing and why does it matter and there are bigger issues in the world and you don't have any money and you'd like to have health care and you want to have kids and you don't own a house and you're $80,000 in debt and your car's broken and all of these things, it's really great when somebody is a good host and takes good care of you because um, artists can be fragile and they can be filled with doubt. And so great residencies that want to take care of you and create community are really special places and worthy of your support and worthy of your time. And there are many of them. I suppose one I've, I've had a great experience with. So it made sense as a platform to bring a group of students to talk about what that meant and then to talk about how we supported each other and created space for one another within this, um, within that kind of temporary space that is a residency. So these are just crazy photos of the projects they did, which I'm not even going to explain. It doesn't matter. They were amazing, um, including this one. What's going on here? I'm not going to tell you. It's a guy with a Mac screen on his head in the lake. Um, and then uh, kind of the last independent project was um, at Elsewhere, North Carolina, which is another really kind of amazing uh, residency program in Greensboro in a uh, defunct uh, thrift store um, that is a residency program that's uh, all about kind of working with the materials at hand in that space. Um, and is very kind of outward looking. Um, residents come there to really produce projects with those materials that are meant for the public. It's what they call a living museum. Um, so me and my partner curated a group of sound artists to come out to that space and work with sound in that environment. And what those artists did um, was actually refinish this back stairwell to be a performance space. So it's a theater that's just the stairs, and they refinished it to make this uh, this tiny theater space. There had been some other stuff in there that faced the street. So um, and the and elsewhere continues now to do programming to invite bands and performance and lectures and things to happen within the urban gray ballroom, which is the back stairwell. Um, so uh, in closing, I will tell you that I'm at the Museum of Arts and Design now, where I, I joined them uh, last June in 2015 as their chief curator. Um, because of my background in history and craft, it was interesting to me to take on this post um, to really kind of think about what the expanded field of craft and design is. Um, you might wonder why I'm saying craft. If you're not familiar with the museum, it was the American Craft Museum until it changed its name in 2007. Um, so its history, its foundation, its roots are in craft. Um, but like many institutions, it dropped that from its name and added design, which is one of the things that um, I think as somebody who comes out of craft is always truly distressing is that word has been something that people um, have had a hard time embracing um, or understanding or making meaning with, including a museum that um, was founded on the premise of supporting it. So it's really important to me there as a curator to continually look back to the fact that that museum was founded as a craft museum and then to look forward and, th and think about how are artists, how are people who identify as craftspeople, how are people who are connected to um, the disciplines that come out of the studio craft movement working in those materials and disciplines today. Wood, jewelry, clay, fiber, glass, etc. Um, and then of course we do have design in there and, and uh, that is a part of the mandate. Um, the museum's been an interesting space for me because I think as somebody who tries to think about how to be, to, to treat my role as an organizer and curator um, and teacher in a kind of activist way, how can I work in an institutional setting um, to do, to make change um, and to make things happen that, that seem important and urgent. 
And I'm going to be honest and say it's very, 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 very hard. Is that enough berries? Um, and I'm telling you that because I know the frustration of being an artist and being somewhere and looking at the museum that's in your city or in your region or even not in your region and wondering like, oh, why do I see the same artists in these shows? Or, you know, why are they not showing more challenging work? Or why, why this, why that? Um, and that's because the institutions are really calcified and it's the way they're structured, it's the way they're built. Um, and you really have to look deep into the DNA of how an institution was created to really understand why you might not see change there as quickly as you want to, or why you might not see the things there that you'd like, like appropriate artist fees, um, you know, or why you might not um, kind of see a museum react quickly to current political events. Um, my favorite thing to tell people is, is that in every museum is an alternative space and it's called the education department. That's where they're really doing that kind of work because they can work faster, they're working under the radar, um, and people aren't like, keep, you know, keeping an eye on uh, and critiquing what they're doing. And by people, I often mean the board. So a board has a lot of influence over what an institution shows. They often are the people who are supporting an institution financially the most, and that tends to translate into board members feeling like they have a say in what they see in the museums uh, that they're a part of. And it's different with different museums and different institutions, but I'm just kind of framing that to say like it's a complicated space. Um, when I started at the museum, um, it's a blessing and a curse, but there were no, there were basically no shows on the calendar, too. So I was able to do some things very quickly, and, and one of the things um, that I did do, which mattered quite a bit to me, was bring in Ebony Patterson's exhibition, Dead Trees. Um, Ebony is a Jamaican artist who works um, out of uh, both Lexington, Kentucky, um, and Kingston, Jamaica. And um, her work um, is very powerful. It talks about, um, you know, the overarching kind of concerns of her work are around visibility, um, and whether and visibility and representation and race. And this project, Dead Trees, um, she produced these tapestries, which you can sort of see here on the floor, um, as well as this. Um, uh, kind of uh, grouping of mannequins in the back um, where she's talking about how um, marginalized uh, communities of color use personal adornment, fashion, um, in order to have visibility, to create visibility for themselves socio socially and politically. Um, the tapestries are really um, complex, interesting works where she was fascinated by the ease at which people shared images of murder victims on the internet, murders, uh, victims of gang violence and police violence. Um, of dead bodies, you know, and that um, that the sharing of those images while the intention is to raise some political awareness also in many ways dehumanizes the victim and turns them into an object. So she made these tapestries where she um, re-photographed scenes and images that she saw, but she took the, um, she dress, she would re-photograph them in the studio, so have somebody pose, dress them in really um, colorful, vibrant, uh, celebratory garments, and then delete the actual body from the image, just leaving the clothes and the shoes and the personal adornment, and then um, put them on sort of a tapestry-like floral background and have those jacquard woven, and then go back into those tapestries and, em and embellish them and um, with flowers and sequins and beads, et cetera. So um, the exhibition consisted of uh, seven of these tapestries um, and then the mannequins that you see in the back. Um, and then we uh, commissioned her uh, to do an intervention with our jewelry collection. Um, the museum has a significant collection of uh, studio art jewelry, um, and we have these permanent, this permanent casework in the museum. And um, I think one of the things that um, maybe uh, I found exciting um, and filled with potential was inviting artists who were interested in adornment as a subject matter to come in and look at the jewelry collection and the work of artists in the studio jewelry movement and kind of reframe that work um, in a much more kind of critical and political way. Um, or really ultimately reframe that work in the way most of those artists intended. Now a lot of the jewelry shows that had happened at the museum had really um, diluted or diminished a lot of that intention that the artists had brought to the work. So with Ebony, she curated pieces that dealt with politics of visibility, race, police violence, um, war. Um, she, she curated selections that had that content in the work and then um, brought them into this installation that she did where she used um, silk flowers that were all, rep all 
poisonous flowers if they were real and uh, created this garden, this kind of poisonous garden. Um, it was inspired by um, a Jamaican poet um, and the, the title of the poem was um, called Oliver Senior, the, the writer, the poet is Oliver Senior and the poem is called Buried Again to Carry On Growing and the poem is about um, the author is finding a dead body in a garden and doesn't know uh, their name but knows that they were um, a victim of murder and then and then hidden, you know, and, and wonders about the life, um, this kind of young life that was lost. And so Ebony created this space um, with these uh, the same kind of mannequin bodies that she used in the main exhibition, sort of within the context of this poisonous garden and with the kind of adornment and jewelry that she selected from the collection. Um, it was uh, well received uh, in some ways and then also really controversial with uh, a lot of other people who, you know, just want to see the jewelry nicely displayed. I, there was <laughs> somebody who said to me, "Why can't you just put it, just put it on a on a body, just hang it on a mannequin, just put it in there on a mannequin?" It's like, okay, that's what I have to work against. This is a powerful, political, exciting, interesting show. This is the work I want to do here, and so um, this is what I'm trying to to accomplish at the museum. Um, and I'm I'll just kind of end by saying that. Um, it's a it's an interesting challenge and it's exciting to me, um, but uh, as you can probably tell from this talk, it's one that where I also constantly have to kind of reflect and think about my practice just as an artist does and decide as always, you know, where are the best places to put my energy, um, to put my politics, to put the things that I care about in the arts. Thank you. I answered all your questions by speaking. <laughs> um, sure, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think that, that it's riskier doing work in institutions because um, I had a lot of freedom um, at Three Walls, and uh, there was a lot of privilege with that freedom. It was really hard work to get that freedom, you know, to make sure that that thing stayed afloat and uh, that space was possible. Um, but um, there, in some ways, while that space was very much about giving artists an opportunity to take risk in their practices and try to help them match them with the resources they needed and um, you know, in the kind of a big picture way, it wasn't risky because I didn't have to ask permission from anybody to do that work. Um, if permission is what constructs risk, you know, hypothetically. Um, in an institutional setting, um, you are, uh, you know, more politically trying to get uh, people on your side, to get them to work with you, to get them to support projects, to see their value, to think outside the box. And actually the latter one is the most surprising thing is that I find it very diff find it very surprising how much um, people are comfortable with the box in the institution um, because, but, but at the same time I also understand that lots of people just want a job and they want to get paid and they want to be secure and institutions provide that to a lot of people. They, it's a secure nine to five job, they wanna go to work, they wanna do the paperwork and they wanna go home and they wanna think about it. And museums are a place that are populated by a lot of people who are in that position. So it, for me, I think in an institution, the risk question comes kind of down to like, how can I get everybody into the idea of taking risks? Like, how can I get everyone sort of excited about that and what that means and get them on board and, you know, ferrying people through the Ebony Patterson project at first, like I came in there with like gusto, like, yeah, this is great. This is obvious, no brainer. Look at this artist, she's amazing. She's blowing up, people are excited about her work. She hasn't had a show in New York, Let, let's do this, yes. And then when it's happening, everyone's kind of like nervous about the flowers and like, oh, this is gonna, this is hard, this is gonna be a lot of work. I mean, really basic stuff, like just like really having a hard time with negotiating, giving up the space of the museum to an artist and the ideals that that artist has and the things that they wanna see happen. And it's like that simple, like it's control. Don't wanna give up control. Don't wanna have to like, you know, don't wanna have to go too far out of the comfort zone. And so um, 
in this sort of funny way, it's like the risks on the surface to a public might seem smaller or easier, like, well, what, why was that hard to put on that show? No big deal. Um, whereas you do something over at Three Walls, and it's like, wow, you created a grant, you created a conference, you published a book, amazing. But those things are possible in that space. Those things are not possible in the museum space. So it's, they're just sort of different, um, you know, they're just very different kind of circumstances to get work done. But of course, the obvious thing is, is that certainly large institutions have potentially larger audiences. So, you know, um, I guess uh, sometimes those risks are really worth taking in order to get that work seen and those ideas out there. Does that answer that question? <laughs> yeah. Hello. Lots of different advice. <laughs> um, not probably any single thing, but um, I think probably um, it would just be more uh, saying things like, um, you really need the energy to do it and be really um, can have a lot of conviction about why you're doing this thing and what it means to do this and be open to working with other people. It's, I hate, you know, that cliche, like it takes a village. It's like, well, yeah, starting a space does take a village. You need an you need a com kind of community around you to support that work. And um, I think uh, it takes a lot of energy and passion to sort of get that stuff done. And so I think be ready with that, you know, be ready with that commitment, We're ready for that commitment, ready with that commitment. Um, I think it goes without saying that it's not easy, um, but um, I think at the same time, it's maybe r more easy than you think, you know? It's, they're actually, if it's actually, fine, you can, you can start things yourself, it's okay, you know, <laughs> there are no rules, that should be the kind of thing that we think about um, in the art world is that it, we should want to exploit the radical potential that art should have, and that means um, not looking around for that permission and doing the things that you think are important um, right now for the colleague, like, and, and it's okay to think small, to look around you and be like, what do my colleagues need, what are the resources the people right next to me need right now, and how can I help create them? Um, so I don't know, it's like that kind of advice and that there's a lot of people out there to ask for help from and for feedback and how they did it and to not be afraid to call somebody and not think you're inventing, reinventing the wheel from scratch and it really is the kind of space where I think people are supportive and excited that other people want to do that work. It's not a competition, um, I think in the artist run sphere at all. Yeah. you know I think yes absolutely I think it depends on what kind of site specificity you're thinking of because there's public art which then of course becomes this kind of complicated bureaucratic thing pr RFP process you know committee process where maybe you're not making the exciting work you want to then there's working through an institution that can help broker those relationships and there's exciting organizations like creative time that that's really what they do they are about making site-specific public artworks um, I think there could be more organizations like Creative Time <laughs> because I, I feel like they've made, um, they've made it possible for sort of projects that require more funding or more support to happen and to cut, they, they are able to cut through the red tape to kind of um, realize those things. 
Um, but I think on a really small scale, like site-specific things that are, um, you know, maybe not grand can still happen, you know? They can happen in a car, they can happen in a trailer, they can happen in a backyard, they can happen in a park, they can happen, you know, they, they don't have to be big grand um, gestures that can still kind of have immediate power even if they're very temporary. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's just a range of ways that that's, that that's still doable. Um, I think there's a lot of curators who have been, um, independent curators in particular, that have been thinking through that. There's a young curator in Chicago named Allison Glenn who just recently did a project, a billboard project, that she raised money for. So that's one way she could do that, right? She could raise money to pay for the billboards and rent them and then was commissioning um, various artists of color, not just in Chicago, but beyond to do these, um, like not just text-based works, but just billboard-based works in Chicago. So she brokered that as an independent curator. So um, I think it just, I think, you know, it's just again about thinking creatively about what space is, what site specific, where, what are ways to kind of create the funding, what are the, what kind of red tape are you willing to work on cutting through? Um, but I think it's really feasible. It might take a long time to be Christo or to be, you know, but, but I, I think it's, um, it's just all about, um, you know, I, I, you know, maybe I, I forget who said this, but an, an artist said to me once that that their um, one of their materials was bureaucracy. Like they just <laughs> that part of their work was like figuring out how to like navigate that, and that they were f fluent as fluent in navigating bureaucracy and red tape to get their work done as somebody might be with like a, um, you know, a hundred pounds of porcelain or something. <laughs> Yeah, thank you.